Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 5 of what if I was reborn into the Bleach universe and became a hollow with a system. Let the tale begin. Chapter 77, Change in Plans Wait, that's not a Bleach ability, Hisashi thought in confusion seeing the reward. It took him a while before he could remember what it was from. It had been decades since his reincarnation after all. He had made sure to go over his memories regarding Bleach quite a bit the moment he found out he was in the Bleach universe, but his memories of other properties had faded even further. If he recalled correctly it was a skill or technique from Zombie Powder. A prior property by Tai Kubo, the same creator that created Bleach. He didn't remember much about it though. The Zanjutsu part of the name made it clear it would involve swords and he remembered something about fire, but that was the extent of it. He wouldn't complain about being offered a skill though. Going over the mission itself made him contemplate the goal more. It was definitely something he really wanted to do and if it was a mission given to him it should be something he could achieve somehow. His system had yet to give him a mission he couldn't achieve. He hadn't managed to completely figure out how to complete the Hogyoku mission, but even there he was slowly making progress figuring out how to achieve it and he suspected it too must be possible if it was being offered at all and this mission at least wasn't dangerous like that one was. Show my my status, he told his system after some consideration. Notification summary. Plus 9, 112, 740 XP from Hollow. Plus 446, 600 spirit power from Hollow. Plus 410, 872 spirit power from spiritual energy absorption. Plus 30 levels. Plus 30 stat points. Status panel. Name, Saito Hisashi. Soul age, 58. Race, hollow. Rank, Vasto Lord. Level, 230 to 260. XP. 231,790 out of 265,650. Stats Strength, 325. Dexterity, 651. Constitution, 150. Intelligence, 250. Spirit Power, 3,048,941 to 3,906,413. Available Stat Points 0 to 30. Passive skills. Spiritual energy absorption. Ultra speed regeneration. Acidic touch. Silencioso. Active skills. Soul body separation. Spirit power concealment. Illusory aura. Blood. Energy blade. Transcribe. Hachijio Sogai. Zero. Cumin. Negation. Skill infusion. Sonido. Looking over his skills he finally put together that he might be able to use, skill infusion, to temporarily grant, ultra speed regeneration, to Nell 2 increasing her regeneration massively and speeding up her recovery. Since it was capable of repairing his own mask it should be able to do the same for Nell 2 for the duration she has it. Even if it takes multiple attempts it should at least make some progress every time at worst. During one of his returns to their hideout he pulled aside Nell too. She seemed excited by the attention. What's up Hitashi? she asked. Hisashi hesitated for a moment. Part of him felt guilty. Currently Nell too was enjoying her life to the fullest due to her amnesia. If he healed her that might very well go away, but on the other hand if he didn't he would be forcing a risk on her with what would be happening between the things going on in Los Noches and what Soul Society and Ichigo's group would be doing. He looked at her cracked mask. He reached out caressing the damaged area gently. If I could heal you faster, would you want me to? He asked her deciding to still bring it up, but leave the choice to her. Nell too went quiet for a while and seemed in thought which was unusual for her. She eventually nodded to herself, seeming to have made up her mind. If I do, can I protect all my big brothers and sisters? She asked. Hisashi sighed, looking at the cute girl. Maybe. He said hesitantly. I can't guarantee you will be able to protect all of us, but you would be able to help us, he continued. Then heal me, she said. Are you sure? He asked. She gave him a firm nod. 
He placed his blade on her mask, softly caressing the crack in it as he began infusing ultra-speed regeneration with his entire pool of spirit power. She looked up at him curiously with her big brown eyes. At first he thought nothing was happening, but after inspecting closer he could see the crack slowly closing up at a speed visible to the naked eye. It was a bit of a letdown, no magical transformation yet, but at least it seemed to be working as it was healing much faster than it was before. Now all he could do was continue to infuse ultra-speed regeneration to maintain the healing in hope that once the crack had healed completely she would regain her original form, strength, and memories. Before moving on he took another look at his system. Put 25 points into constitution and the rest into dexterity, he ordered the system trying to maximize his survivability. Dexterity, 651-656. Constitution, 150-175. Available stat points, 30-0. Hisashi continued hunting, but would return much more regular. No longer would he stay away for weeks at a time. Also he could keep recharging, ultra-speed regeneration, on Nell 2 before it ran out for her to heal as fast as possible. Nell 2 was just happy she could see her big brother more even when she didn't join him on his trips out. Playing games with him was her favorite pastime, after all. Haribel was happy to find out her little Nell 2 was being healed unaware that this would make the relationship between the two quite a bit more awkward. Adult Nellyel was quite different from child Nell 2 with her amnesia. It would be hard for her to baby a mature and adult Nellyel after all. That was just a concern the two of them would need to work out at that point. Thankfully a couple weeks was all it took and Nell 2's cracked mask was on the verge of being healed entirely. The moment they were all spectating as the last remaining fractions of the crack were filling and they were surprised when a massive amount of spirit pressure started leaking from Nell 2 who just seemed to be in some kind of trance. Hisashi immediately threw up a Hachijio Sogai barrier to cover it up. Chapter 78 Growing the moment her crack healed completely the spirit pressure became even heavier and Nell 2's body began to grow. The large scar across her face had disappeared right along with the crack on her hollow mask like they had never been there in the first place. Her short vibrant green hair grew along with her body until it reached all the way down to her ass. The originally large rags she was wearing were now struggling to cover her chest and ass with the bottoms of both peeking out from under it. Something Hisashi definitely appreciated. Unfortunately, he didn't have any access to clothing to help her cover up right now. A large black number 3 tattoo was visible on her back. She was also holding a katana-shaped zampakudo in her hand now that hadn't been there before. She suddenly rushed at Isashi faster than any of the others could respond. All she ended up doing was giving him a big hug while rubbing her face into his chest happily. Despite her having hugged him plenty of times in her child form, Hisashi blushed quite heavily when her busty adult form was pressing her breasts against him. How was he a two-lifetimes virgin supposed to react to such a thing? He might talk a big game, but that's all it was. Talk. As for real experience, he had little to none, so this was kind of beyond his level. All he could do was try not to stare at her cleavage and awkwardly hug her back while avoiding cutting her with his blades. What did you do to Nell too? Haribel shouted. She's okay, really, Hisashi told her awkwardly. Nellyel very well might be older than Haribel herself despite her treating her like some kind of surrogate daughter while she was in her child form. Pesh and Dondo Chaka hugged each other with tears in their eyes. They might have hoped that Nellyel never recovered so she could enjoy her life in ignorant bliss, but that didn't mean they didn't miss their former superior. Nelsama, they cried out together. Oh my! Sun Sun said with a playful smile. Hisashi coughed awkwardly. Enel, are you okay? He said nervously. He wasn't sure exactly what to expect. He had healed her injury and returned her to her full power and adult form, but he hadn't been sure whether that would also return her original personality and memories or whether she would remain with the child Nell to personality. Nellyel hummed happily after realizing what she did she blushed and coughed awkwardly too. Um, yes. I'm feeling much better, she said. She looked over to Pesh and Dondo Chaka with a warm smile. Thank you for being there for me and protecting me when I couldn't, she said to them. 
Hisashi wasn't sure how to respond. She might have acted embarrassed, but she still hadn't stopped hugging him putting him in a rather awkward spot. Apache looked down at her chest, then at Nelial's, then back at her own, then at Harabelle's, then back at her own, then at Mila Rose's, and finally back to her own again. For some reason I'm feeling really annoyed, she mumbled. Looking over at Sung Sun's non-existent chest, because she was a snake, she felt a little better at least. Mila Rose looked Nelial up and down. You look stronger, she told her. Apache deadpanned at Nelial still hugging Hisashi. Are you going to let go of him? she asked. Hmm? Nelial hummed and seemed to think about it for a while before shaking her head. No. I like it, she said adamantly. Maybe I should do the same. Sung Sun teased. Nelial hugged him tighter glaring at Sung Sun. Sung Sun smirked. Oh? You don't want to share your big brother? She continued to tease Nelial. Nelial's blush became even deeper, but she remained adamant. To be fair she had been hugging, climbing on and messing with Hisashi in general when she was Nell too and no one had said a thing to deter her. It's just that it didn't look nor feel quite as innocent when it was a busty young woman doing so rather than a snot-nosed brat. She didn't seem to care about there or even his feelings though. Thank you Hisashi, she said with a big happy smile. At least she said my name right now, he thought with a sigh that turned into a small smile. He was a little conflicted right now. Part of him still saw her as the little sister he had been taking care of for months now, but a different part just couldn't see her that way anymore. He was still a man after all. His eyes couldn't help but be drawn to her lips that were way too close. He gulped. Ahem, Nelio Sama, shouldn't you be thankful and hug this too? Pesh said sadly. Hmm, but Hisashi smells good, Nelio mumbled. Yeah, we worked really hard. Don't you know? Dondo Chaka said. Thanks, you two always have my back, she said with a soft smile. That seemed to make the two of them happier. Don't forget about Bawa Bawa, don't you know? Dondo Chak said righteously. Nelial chuckled lightly. Of course, how could I ever forget about him, she said. Hisashi felt kind of awkward since she was still hugging him tightly and he didn't have the heart nor hands to push her away. Okay. Okay. Enough of this, Apache growled out finally splitting the two up. Sun Sun smirked. Jealous are we? she asked. Apache shrugged. No one's jealous. Just don't want to see it, she bit back. Hisashi smirked. Whatever you say, dear, he said joining Sun Sun and teasing her. Mila Rose, you're tired of it too, right? Apache asked Mila Rose. The gruff lioness just shrugged though. Why do you care? she asked. Apache snorted and walked off in a huff. Whatever, she grumbled. Haribelt softly chuckled. She will come back around, she said. Hisashi nodded. She dash he started. Suddenly they heard a loud crash coming from outside their hideout. They all rushed up the stairs. Chapter 79 Old Friends and Reunions When they got to the top of the stairs they found an errand car. It looked like it was a failure of an errand car though since it still retained a large amount of animal traits rather than the mostly human-like traits an errand car is supposed to possess. It also didn't have a Zampakudo like Grimjow and Nelial who were also errand car did. It still had its great clammy shark-like skin and hammerhead shark head with a crack in it. Only its human mouth revealed showing that it wasn't a regular hollow. The moment Hisashi saw the hammerhead shark Aaron car he activated his illusory aura on himself setting it to make him incapable of seeing Aizen's Zampakudo. If the hammerhead Aaron car was here chances were Aizen was somewhere nearby and he couldn't take any risks of him seeing Aizen's Zampakudo release and getting permanently hypnotized. He also suppressed his silencioso and reduced his spirit power concealment so instead his spirit power not showing up at all he appeared to be within the range of a normal vasto lord. His ability for illusions, hiding the sounds he created and hiding his spirit power all needed to remain hidden from Aizen if he wanted the best chance at ever stealing the Ogyoku. If Aizen was aware of these abilities he would prepare for them. 
If this became a battle he would only be able to use, illusory aura, indirectly to conceal his suspicious powers, but nothing more or anyone would know he had some kind of illusion ability. The hammerhead Aaron Carr looked curious when Isashi came up the stairs in the lead, but quickly lost his patience once he saw Ter Haribel behind him. Haribel, long time no see, he said. Haribel seemed to recognize him. You're, she said vaguely remembering this rude member of Berrigan's army. She was the one responsible for the scar across his head after all. That's right. Do you remember now? You made me look like quite a fool, he said before suddenly unleashing his spirit pressure. All of them except Hisashi were shocked by the amount of spirit pressure he was exuding. Unlike his intent though they were just surprised. It wasn't enough to actually scare them. Even less so with Hisashi and Neliel around. The pressure Hisashi gave off during his transformation and Neliel when she healed made this little bit of pressure look like nothing much. So even though the pressure he was giving off told them he could kill them they still felt safe. Haribel raised her brow and looked over at Isashi. Is this what you were warning us about? she asked curiously. Hisashi sighed. Well, I wasn't quite expecting it at the moment, but yes, he answered. It's that blowhard again? Didn't Haribel already teach him a lesson? Apache taunted. Yeah, he just doesn't seem to learn, Sun Sun chimed in. He is even smaller now so maybe he has to compensate even harder, Mila Rose said with a smirk. Their flippant response seemed to anger the hammerhead Arancar further. He felt that despite becoming an Arancar, something way above these mere hollow that he was still being looked down upon. It was unacceptable. Enough. Don't worry. I won't devour you. I'll wipe you all out without a trace, he said arrogantly. A red zero started forming in front of his hand. Before he could fully charge it an energy blade slashed through it dispersing the gathering spirit particles and causing a cut across his hand and forearm. It didn't manage to cut all the way through though, just cutting deeply into the skin. Unfortunately, for the hammerhead Aaron Carr he didn't have high-speed regeneration and it wouldn't heal any time soon. Hisashi had slashed with one of his blades. You seem to be forgetting about me, he said with an annoyed look. Not only was the hammerhead Aaron Carr ignoring him, but he was also planning on attacking his friends. Even if he was aware of their little feud it still annoyed him. The hammerhead Aaron Carr had been mostly ignoring Hisashi due to his suppressed spirit power making him believe no one there was a threat. Only now did he take a closer look. Another Vasto Lord? Who are you? he asked. He wasn't too concerned believing Hisashi had used his most powerful ability to interrupt him. Given Hisashi's small humanoid form, but lack of a removed mask and Zampakudo he could guess his rank even if he couldn't sense it from the pressure he was giving off. Dead men don't need to know, Hisashi said nonchalantly. You think you have the right to be arrogant just because you managed to land a surprise attack? The hammerhead Arankar retorted. Surprise attack? You just weren't paying attention, Hisashi scoffed annoying the hammerhead Arankar even further. That's enough out of you, the hammerhead Arankar yelled dashing at Hisashi at a speed he believed would be beyond any Vasto Lord. Haribel intercepted the attack blocking him with her giant bone broadsword arm. She struggled to stop him though, her feet digging into the sand as he slowly forced her back. You guys run. I'll keep him busy, she yelled at the rest of them more worried about them than herself. She could tell from the spirit pressure that this Arankar was more powerful than her, Sun Sun, Apache and Mila Rose at least. Hisashi let out a deep sigh. Haribel, you're going to need to learn you aren't in this alone anymore, he berated her. The Trace Bestias got up behind Haribel. That's right Haribel-sama, Apache said. You can rely on us too, Mila Rose chimed in. We can't let you have all the fun yourself after all, Sung Sung said with a smirk. Haribel looked back at her friends and was unsure what to think. Part of her was worried and was screaming at her to save them at any cost, but she was starting to realize it wasn't just them relying on her anymore. She could rely on them too. Chapter 80 New Perspectives Hisashi stayed back. 
although it wouldn't quite be the learning experience the Hammerhead Erencar was originally supposed to give them now that most of them were Vasto Lord it might still be a helpful experience seeing how powerful an Erencar is even if this one is kind of a loser. Not so cocky now are you Haribel? the Hammerhead Erencar asked. She just snorted in response. Let's do this Haribel Sama, Apache said excitedly. We've got your back, Mila Rose agreed. Sung Sun hissed aggressively, but seemed the least confident. He couldn't blame her since she was currently by far the weakest among them. All four of them looked raring to go though. Don't worry. I'll get to all of you soon enough. Now let's have some fun, the hammerhead Erencar said arrogantly. Though they weren't actually that far apart in strength or speed they struggled to do any damage due to his arrow massively increasing his defense making them unable to do any real damage to him. The only one even able to leave any scratches was Haribel. Their teamwork prevented him from retaliating though as the moment he targeted one of them the other three would attack in unison to cover them. This way they went back and forth while managing to chip away at him from relative safety. It was like dancing on the edge of a coin though as any of his attacks could do serious damage to them. As the battle progressed their teamwork improved, but it didn't take long for them to realize this was a losing battle as their stamina wouldn't last as long as the Aaron cars. They didn't have a choice though. This went on for a while as the four of them struggled more and more to keep up with him. More and more close calls were building up damage across their bodies and their stamina was running out. Hisashi was an exception being able to keep up with Grimjow even in his resurrection form. The current situation was the expectation when an Erencar was facing a regular hollow, even if it was a Vasto Lord. Things took another turn for the worse when the Hammerhead Erencar summoned some kind of energy weapon and his hand made of spirit particles. It may not be as effective as a Zampakudo, but it was more than enough to double the pressure the girls were experiencing while dealing with him. Eventually they slipped up. The Hammerhead Erencar dashed towards Haribel and none of the others were close enough to cover for her. Finally! Got you, he said, excited to exact his revenge for the humiliation the bitch put him through. He swung for Haribel. She could see the attack coming, but couldn't do anything about it as he was faster than her. She closed her eyes waiting for the pain to come. Hisashi blocked his attack crossing blades at the last moment to reveal as little as possible of his abilities and acted like he was struggling. After dealing with Grimjow this guy was simply too weak. He wasn't even secretly using, blood, to augment his body and he still needed to feign being weaker and slower. This guy truly was rather failure of an Erencar in every way, yet he was still so arrogant. Hisashi really had the urge to smack some humility into him with how much he had run his mouth. You seem to be forgetting about me again, Hisashi teased. Haribel opened her eyes in shock looking at Hisashi in front of her. This was the first time in forever that someone had protected her. She had gotten so used to being the one protecting everyone else. You're not as bad as I thought, the Hammerhead Hollow said arrogantly. He hadn't even realized he was being played. Hisashi was convinced with Haribel, Apache, and Mila Rose all being Vasto Lord now and Sung Sun being in Ajuchas they would probably have been able to survive him this time around even without his help. His help just made it overkill, his only concern was putting on a show for Aizen who was probably watching like he had been when this had happened in the original version. The Hammerhead Erencar smirked. Why are you protecting these weak females? You should follow Lord Berrigan instead, he said. I don't know where you're looking, but the only weakling I see is you, Hisashi responded. It's a shame you'll just die with them, the hammerhead Erencar said while slashing at Hisashi with the energy weapon again. While blocking his slash with his two top arms Hisashi used the lower two to skewer the hammerhead Erencar's torso. G.U.H., the hammerhead Erencar grunted in pain. The spirit particle weapon dispersed as he lost focus. While he had him pierced Hisashi could feel, transcribe, copying his experience. Most of it was pretty useless garbage, but he at least had some experience with Sonido, which was now being added to Hisashi's own budding experience with Sonido. The rest of his experience was barely even worth it with how little it added to Hisashi's combat ability. Every little bit helped though. It didn't take the hammerhead Erencar long to jump back, Hisashi's blades slipping out of his chest. 
Hisashi was having a harder time not making it look like he was steamrolling the guy than the actual fight itself was. He even had to be careful when attacking him since his defense couldn't resist his blades and he didn't have high speed regeneration either. Unless Hisashi held back on his speed even dodging would be impossible for him. It seems I'll have to take this seriously, the hammerhead Erencar said. He recreated the spirit particle weapon. Add limited cognitive ability to the list considering he wasn't running when struggling with one of the Vasto Lords he was facing when there were three more Vasto Lords that could back Hisashi up. He even excused him being unaware of Nelil and her fraction since they hadn't come out of the cave yet. The hammerhead Erencar got back into a fighting stance and glared at Haribel. You will regret resisting Lord Berrigan, he said arrogantly. Do you need any help? Apache asked with concern. Hisashi smirked. With this small fry, he asked without any real concern. She just snorted in response. Couldn't he be a little more considerate when she was showing actual worry for once? Chapter 81, Last but Not Least The girl stepped back letting Hisashi take the lead so they could recover from their wounds and exhaustion. They remained vigilant ready to jump in the moment they felt Hisashi was in danger. You'll regret underestimating me. A Vasto Lord is nothing in front of an Erencar, the Hammerhead Erencar said. We'll just have to see about that, won't we? Hisashi said with a smirk. The Hammerhead Erencar launched himself at Hisashi with a series of slashes, but against his expectations Hisashi managed to parry them expertly diverting the force away from himself. Though both of them were using swords there was only one swordsman among them. They kept clashing, but over time it became clear Hisashi had the upper hand as the injuries just kept piling up on the Erencar due to his lack of regeneration while Hisashi sustained fewer injuries and those he did receive healed in short order. Even if it was slow the tide was inevitable even if the hammerhead Erencar refused to see it instead becoming more reckless as the fight continued. It took quite a while, but eventually the hammerhead Erencar realized he wasn't going to win and rather than concede it took drastic action. It jumped back and started charging Asiro. He wasn't aiming for Hisashi though and instead targeted the still recovering group of Haribel and the Trace Bestias. Hisashi narrowed his eyes. In just a fraction of a moment he crouched down. As long as he played it off as a momentary burst he could probably play it off as not being his regular capabilities. He kicked off causing the ground he was standing on to shatter as he launched himself towards the Hammerhead Erencar. On his way he coated one of his blades with blade energy while using blood artery to strengthen his arm while using illusory aura to hide the effects. Most of those present couldn't even keep up with his movements until he was within arm's reach of the hammerhead Erencar where he made a sudden spin cleanly slicing off the arm that was charging the Ciro. The moment his arm separate falling towards the ground the incomplete Ciro lost control exploding and causing the area around them to be obscured by the dust it kicked up. After a few moments the wind blew away the dust cloud revealing the staggered hammerhead Erencar with his arms severed at the shoulder gasping for breath. Hisashi was standing between him and Haribel's group. Finally Nelil revealed herself by walking out of the cave entrance. What are you doing here? she asked. The hammerhead Erencar looked at her in panic and gulped. W-what-a-r-y-u-d-d doing here Nelil-sama? he asked nervously. She raised her brow. Do I need to tell you about my whereabouts? she asked him. You could almost see the sweat dripping down his face. And no. I thought you had. He stammered. Had what? she asked. And nothing. Great to see you are doing well, he corrected himself quickly. Last he heard Neliel had been defeated, but he was a nobody and lost no chase and Neliel was the former Numero Trace Espada. Meanwhile he was just a low rank numeros. If he annoyed her he wouldn't even know how he died. Neliel tilted her head. Baldi, why were you bothering Hisashi Onayakin? she asked. He was slowly backing away. And no. I would never. He said. You don't think you can just leave, right? Hisashi asked. Before the hammerhead Erencar could react Hisashi had rushed past him. It took a few moments before a bloody line appeared across the Erencar's neck. Then the head separated from the body as his body collapsed. Plus 517, 140 XP. Level up. 
plus 1 available stat points. XP, 293,320 out of 349,800. That wasn't the end of it, though. He skewered the body dragging it behind him as he walked towards the trace bestias. He tossed the corpse in front of Sung Sun. If anything can put you over the edge this should be it, he told her. Sung Sun looked at the tempting corpse, the amount of spirit power it contained was beyond any other hollow she had ever consumed. A are you sure? she asked unsurely. He could tell how affected she was given that she wasn't even trying to tease him for once. He smiled while shaking his head at her awkwardness. Of course I'm sure, he said. She didn't hesitate any longer and consumed the Arankar's corpse. Hisashi's prediction had been on the money as it didn't take long for the pressure around her to fluctuate indicating she was finally breaking through. Since they were already near their hideout she didn't hold it back and due to Aizen likely watching from somewhere near Hisashi didn't use Hachijio Sogai to hide it either. The spirit particles started gathering to her rapidly and this time no one needed protection from the fluctuating spirit pressure since everyone else was already a vast lord. Congrats Sun Sun, we knew you could do it. Apache yelled excitedly. Mila Rose smiled. Yeah, it was about time you joined us, she said. The gathering spirit particles and pressure kicked up a cloud of dust, but they could see Sun Sun's silhouette shrink as she evolved into her vast lord form. Eventually the surging waves of spirit particles subsided and the dust cloud dispersed revealing Sung Sun's new form. She had a long-scaled white snake tail as a lower body that transitioned into a human upper body with scales covering her breasts. She had the same long dark green hair she would have had as an Arankar, but her face was still covered by a bone mask stylized like a snake's face. Her light purple eyes shone through the mask. She had become a half-snake, half-woman like a lamia. The first thing she did was spin around checking herself out. She seemed rather excited about her new more feminine body. Hisashi smiled. Congrats Sun Sun, he said with pride. She stopped checking herself out turning to Hisashi. Do you like what you see? she asked in a teasing tone. Chapter 82, Kind Smiles Hisashi rolled his eyes. Sure, you look stunning Sun Sun, he said. It wasn't a lie. Aside from the snake lower body she did indeed look very good in her new form. They all gathered back up by the entrance now that Sun Sun had completed her transformation. Even Neliel's fraction came out of the cave entrance. Neliel hugged Hisashi again. You should have let me handle it Hisashi, she said with a pout. Hisashi shrugged. I'm fine right, and at last you can say my name right, he said. She blushed a little. That's not fair. I was saying it just fine, I just had a lisp, she said indignantly. He rolled his eyes then looked at Sung Sun with some concern. More importantly now that things have calmed down, how are you feeling Sung Sun, he said. Sexier than ever, she joked. He gave her a deadpan stare. And now seriously, he said. She put on a seductive pan. Ah, come on Hisashi. You're being no fun, she said. Haribel sighed. Just answer Sung Sun, she said. Sung Sun nodded more seriously. I'm feeling great, she finally said. They were suddenly interrupted by a clapping sound. They looked over to find a man with short slick back brown hair wearing a black hakama, black kosode, and a long white coat over it. Hisashi frowned. Aizen. He thought. He had been worried he would be present given how the hammerhead shark Arankar had finally shown up even if much delayed from when he thought it would. Given the butterfly effect though it was hard for him to gauge many events from the original timeline. Most of all things that didn't even have a very clear time of when they did originally happen. There wasn't anything he could do about it now though. Don't mind me, he said as if that was reassuring in any way. All of them were on guard except Neliel who looked shocked seeing eyes in there. She had never imagined meeting him here. I just wanted to offer my apologies. I gave him Arankar powers, but it looks like I didn't give him the brain to control it, Aizen said. He looked over at Neliel. Good work Neliel, he told her. Neliel tilted her head in confusion since she hadn't done anything. 
Okay, she said unsurely. It seemed he was going for a slightly different introduction since he couldn't swoop in like a savior for Haribel and her little group this time. Not only had they managed to resist the Aaron car by themselves, which had greatly surprised Aizen, but Neliel had been there too. One of his former underlings. Somehow she had managed to recover her strength, but despite this she hadn't even needed to interfere with the attack. Ah! How rude of me! I am Aizen. The current leader of Lost No Chase, Aizen said feigning embarrassment. He sure is good at playing meek when he is not entirely sure of himself or the situation, Hisashi thought watching Aizen's performance as if he couldn't have stopped some bottom feeder Erenkar from coming to attack them or save them when it did attack. Hisashi knew Aizen was just using the Erenkar like a disposable pawn to figure out their situation and strength. Then once he saw all he needed to see he would have swept in like their savior and offered them a place in Lost No Chase afterwards, which they then would have happily accepted out of either gratitude or respect for the strength he would have shown off or both. Even just Haribel's potential alone dwarfed the hammerhead Erenkar. The only reason he could even beat her was that he had become an Erenkar while she was still a regular hollow even if she was a vast lord. He was sure Aizen saw the value in her and now after allowing the hammerhead Erenkar to attack them, probably in the rest of them too since he now knew they were all Vastolord already. In his mind they were sure to be the best of potential pawns he could find in Hueco Mundo. I see you're already quite powerful, but if it is power you seek Neliel can attest that I can give it to you. Aizen said. Would you like to join me? We are stronger together, after all, he asked them. It seemed he was changing up the strategy and instead of leaning on their feelings of inferiority and fear he leaned on their sense of camaraderie instead. He might not be familiar with Hisashi, but he was with Neliel and a little about Haribel from Berrigan and his followers. It wasn't hard to guess that if both Neliel and Haribel were outliers among Hollow that cared about their fellow Hollow that the ones that had joined them might be similar. It probably would have worked even perfectly if it hadn't been for Hisashi being very familiar with Aizen's modus operandi and motivations. There was no way he would ever trust Aizen. He didn't need to know that though. Hisashi stepped forward surprising Aizen. He had assumed either Haribel or Neliel would have been the leader, but it seemed he might have been wrong and needed to adjust his expectations. Hisashi smiled softly. We appreciate the offer. Do you mind giving us some time to talk it over and decide? He asked. Aizen gave them a benign smile. Of course, take all the time you need. Once you have made your decision feel free to come to La Snow Chase. Our doors will be open to you any time, he responded. They all nodded. I hope to see you all soon though, he said before leaving. Thankfully he left without bothering them any further after that, confident they would make the right decision soon enough. After they got back to the depths of their hideout, they gathered around a stone table. Don't trust what he says. He's a snake, Hisashi said, surprising some of them who had a good impression of Aizen after their meeting. He looked over at Sun Sun before continuing, no offense. Sun Sun rolled her eyes dramatically. Chapter 83, Where to Go? Haribel nodded carefully. If you say so I'll trust you, she said with determination. Neliel nodded slowly. I can remember everything now that you've healed me, Hisashi. I used to be a high-ranking member in Lost No Chase. The third ranked Espada under Aizen's rule. He has never done anything wrong, but he has always given me a slightly off feeling. I just dismissed it as it just being me, but you seem to feel even stronger about it so maybe it wasn't just me, she admitted. Hisashi smiled and patted her on the head subconsciously due to being so used to doing that to Nell Tuesday surprisingly Neliel didn't reject it though and smiled happily at the attention. He inwardly sighed. They would need to figure out their relationship at some point now that she had regained her memories. She was probably old enough to be as many times over great-grandmother so he couldn't keep treating her like she was his innocent little foul-mouthed sister. Even if she didn't seem to be fighting it so far it just felt strange between her now very adult form and more adult personality. As for joining him we don't have much of a choice. If I'm wrong and he is completely nice and trustworthy as he portrays himself then joining him would be the right choice. If however I'm right and he isn't the way he portrays himself then by refusing we are making him an enemy. 
one with an army of Arankar more powerful than that one you were already struggling with, he said. Haribel and the Trace Bestias looked saddened. They had thought they were amongst the top of the hierarchy in Hueco Mundo only to be instantly disavowed of that belief after one fight. They realized there were still many more powerful than them. Powerful enough that even with all of them sticking together they might not be powerful enough to stand up to them and it made them feel insecure. Then what are we supposed to do? Apache asked in frustration. We were able to beat that Arankar, who says we can't beat the others and lost no chase. Mila Rose stated stubbornly. Hisashi shook his head with a sigh. Was that Arankar powerful before he became an Arankar? he asked. They all shook their heads. No, Haribel could easily thrash him before. He was one of the weaklings under Berrigan, Mila Rose said proudly as if it had been her own achievement. Hisashi nodded. So if one of their weaklings grew powerful enough to handle not only Haribel, but all four of you as Vasto Lord, what do you think happened to the more powerful members that went through the same process to become Arankar? He asked them. That silenced them. T that could be really bad, Apache ventured carefully. Worse yet, how powerful do you think Berrigan would be if he has also become an Arankar? He continued. Haribel sighed. That would be very bad, she confirmed. Mila Rose looked disappointed, but it seemed she finally understood the stakes. You can't just punch everything to fix your problems. At least not unless you are the stronger party. Exactly, so really our only option is to at least act like we are joining them. We will have to make sure we stick together after joining them. We will use them to become more powerful first. We can worry about dealing with them after that, he said. Neliel stepped up. As long as at least one or more of us are Espada we can have our own faction. Pesh, Dondo Chaka, Bawa Bawa and I were together before joining Los Noches. Once I became an Espada they were able to join my faction and we were free to manage our own business as long as we followed the few orders Aizen did issue, she explained. She looked over all those present. Unless a lot has changed in the months I have been away from Lost No Chase this shouldn't be a problem since I should be powerful enough to take up the position of Espada again so we could do that and you could be my fraction. Even without becoming an Arankar Hisashi might be powerful enough to become one too, if so we could also join under him. Finally if you risk it and do become Arankar since you become Vasto Lord before becoming Arankar all of you would probably become powerful enough to qualify as Espada afterwards, she offered. Hisashi smiled at her. Exactly, we just need to stick together, he said. She hugged him excitedly again, just happy he agreed with her. As long as we can stay together, she said. Haribel looked troubled. He couldn't tell if it was about joining Los No Chase and what Neliel said or if she was still dealing with Neliel's sudden transformation. The Trace Bestias looked at Haribel. Though things had shifted as they got to know each other Haribel was still one of the main decision-makers amongst their group. What do you think? Sun Sun asked her. Apache and Mila Rose nodded along also curious to hear what she had to say. Haribel looked back and forth between Neliel, Hisashi, and the Trace Bestias. If Hisashi is right we probably don't have much of a choice and if we can stay together like Nell. Neliel said that's what is most important to me, she said. Hisashi looked at the Trace Bestias. Then what do the three of you think? he asked. We'll follow what Haribel and you decide, Sun Sun said. That's right. Apache said as if it was something to be proud of. Mila Rose simply nodded in agreement. He glanced over at Neliel's fraction. Pesh straightened his back. We follow Neliel Sama, he said. We do, don't you know, Dondo Chaka said in agreement. Well, not like he hadn't expected that. He looked over at Neliel with a smile. She smiled. I'll go wherever you go, she said before blushing when she realized what she had said. Chapter 84 New Digs Hisashi nodded thoughtfully. I guess that decides things then. We will join Los No Chase, but stick together and be prepared to defect if necessary, he confirmed. They all nodded in agreement. They spent a few days going over their plans together and preparing for the move to Los Noches. 
At least there wasn't that much to give in that until recently almost none of them had been humanoid nor had any possessions of their own to take with them which sped up packing a lot. The more important thing they did was to perform some further testing and exercises to make sure both Sung Sun and Neliel were in top shape. Though things would probably go just fine when they joined the errand car it was best to be safe rather than sorry. After all plenty of the errand car wouldn't be that friendly. First and foremost Grimjow who should also be there currently. They decided to take the more leisurely way to travel there by using Bawa Bawa as a form of transport. He didn't even mind everyone riding on him, was just happy to be of use to them for once. He couldn't really help much with actual combat just being a regular hollow unlike the rest, but at least he could be of use in them this way by providing them with comfortable travel. Since she could no longer hang from nor sit on his shoulders Neliel instead decided to use his lap or sometimes even body as a pillow instead while they traveled. He wasn't sure why considering most of his body was pretty hard and not that comfortable with only the parts where his skin was exposed being soft to the touch. The rest felt closer to some kind of armor. Whenever they ran into hollows on the way since everyone had become a vast o Lord Hisashi just eliminated them quickly by himself so he could gain the experience and absorb their spirit power. Haribel still wasn't thrilled, but after experiencing the threat of the Aaron car she just accepted that he had to do that to grow. Her only expectation was that he couldn't attack any hollows that didn't attack them first. Hisashi decided it was a fair enough compromise if it kept Haribel from becoming mad with him so he readily agreed. Despite Bawabawa's speed it still took a couple of weeks to make it to Lost No Chase. Haribel had made sure their hideout was far from Barrigan's after the last encounter they had had with him and Hueco Mundo was a very large place. Finally when they passed over one of the countless white dunes they had passed they saw a giant structure in the distance. A huge building tall enough to house skyscrapers and large enough to fit an entire city topped with a dome. It was surrounded by similarly tall towers that flared at the base equally spaced around its circumference. All of it was constructed of the same even white material as if every nook and cranny had been meticulously stuccoed until every surface was smooth white giving it a cold clinical look. It stood out among the near endless nothingness that the white desert surface of Hueco Mundo presented. Due to how massive the structure was despite being able to see it, it still took them a while to reach the entrance. He decided to review his status before entering the den of vipers that was lost no chase. Equals notification summary equals. Mission completed, heal Neliel to Odell Schwank. Active skill, Karen Zanjutsu gained. Karen Zanjutsu. An ancient sword technique that combines swordsmanship and the control of the black flames of bloodlust which unlike regular fire can turn physical. The flames can be used for offensive techniques either for their destructive properties or to reinforce the user's weapon. Common forms used for the flames outside of enhancing one's attacks are chains to bind or a shield to protect. Plus 4, 556, 370 XP from hollow. Plus 223, 300 spirit power from hollow. Plus 205, 436 spirit power from spiritual energy absorption. Plus 12 levels. Plus 12 stat points. Status panel. Name, Saito Hisashi. Soul age, 58 to 59. Race, hollow. Rank, Vasto Lord. Level, 260 to 272. XP. 8,310 out of 371,280. Stats. Strength, 325. Dexterity, 656. Constitution, 175. Intelligence, 250. Spirit Power, 3,906,413 to 4,335,149. Available Stat Points. 0 to 12. Passive skills. Spiritual energy absorption. Ultra speed regeneration. Acidic touch. Silencioso. Active skills. Soul body separation. Spirit power concealment. Illusory aura. Blood. Energy blade. Transcribe. Hachijio Sogai. Ciro. Cumin. Negation. Skill infusion. Somido. Karen Zanjutsu.
Karen's Anjutsu had been his reward for healing Neliel. He hadn't been entirely sure about it, but it was actually a rather useful technique for him considering he was a swordsman and used multiple swords. It would not only enhance his swordsmanship itself, but also extend his range of abilities he could use during fights. He could use it as a form of crowd control and also to protect himself both of which were more than worth it. It wasn't like he wouldn't have wanted to heal her anyway. Even if the system was kind enough to give him the full knowledge of all techniques using the Karen's Anjutsu ability, just like with the other abilities granted by the system it would still take quite some practice and real combat experience to fully integrate it with his combat style. Until he did he wouldn't be able to bring out the full potential of the abilities. At least switching back to being the only one consuming hollows had helped maintain some growth even against the ever-slowing leveling up. He wasn't sure if there was a level cap, but even if there wasn't at a certain point it was bound to crawl to a halt simply due to the world eventually being unable to produce enough spiritual beings to consume to continue growing. It was already taking him weeks to gain a single level. Soon enough he knew it would be months and eventually decades might pass without a single level up. Chapter 85, Cold Reception He didn't really want to think of the possibility of centuries. Unlike Shinigami it never was really clarified about Hollow whether they aged and died though it seemed unlikely as long as a Hollow continued to consume spirits. They could starve and degrade back to mindless Hollow however the only way towards death seemed to be for a Quincy to obliterate their soul or a Shinigami to purify it. Part of him realized this meant eventually everyone he knew while alive would pass. Even if they become spirits that was still a temporary state where eventually their soul would be bleached and they reincarnated as a blank slate. The only ones that might be able to stick with him in the long run were other hollow like Haribel, the Trace Bestias, Neliel, and Neliel's Fraction. That is if they didn't die of unnatural causes of course. Hueco Mundo wasn't a safe place for hollow and earth and soul society even less so. Plenty of possibilities for death. The only thing he could do was to continue helping them grow as he had done by turning them into Vasto Lord before they even became Arankar. This should massively improve their chances for survival. He was kind of stuck what else he could do for them. Once they became Arankar he had no real clue how to help them grow further. Just one of the many things he needed to figure out at some point. For now he needed to worry about how they were going to survive joining Lost No Chase and impossibly stealing the Hogyoku from Aizen which were already more than enough to keep him occupied. He sighed. Just put ten points into intelligence and the what's left over to Dexterity, he ordered the system. Dexterity, 656 to 658. Intelligence, 250 to 260. Available stat points, 12 to 0. When they finally made it to the structure the Trace Bestias looked up at the walls of Lost No Chase with some trepidation. Hisashi gave them an awkward smile. We're going to be okay, he tried to comfort them. He wasn't even entirely sure himself though since usually he went into situations knowing he was completely able to deal with any challenge that may come his way. This time was different though. Even if he became an Arankar he wasn't sure he would be able to handle all of Lost No Chase and Aizen, let alone now while most of them were all still regular hollow. They were greeted by two Arankar at the gates. A slender teenage-looking female Arankar sporting long, black hair tied into two pigtails. Only one of her pink eyes are visible because the other is covered by her hollow mask and bangs. She was wearing a short, frilly skirt. A sleeveless top that left most of her front including her cleavage uncovered with the exception of two pieces that wrapped around her side to cover just past her nipples. She wore white bracers that covered her forearms. It was Loli Avern. Hisashi thought she was quite cute and if it weren't for him knowing about her rotten personality he would have been more than happy for a chance to get to know her better. The other was also a teenage-looking female Arankar, but rather than feminine this one looked like a tomboy. She had short, slick back blonde hair with a fringe that covered her right eye which was also covered by her hollow mask unlike her left which was green. She wore a short-sleeved white top with an upturned collar that was zipped down far enough to reveal her cleavage. The top left her thighs exposed. A black sash held up her white hakama. This was Minoli Malia. 
Unlike Loli, her personality at least was much better, though she was kind of a pushover so she couldn't really be trusted. The two were like a mirror reflection to each other. Inverted. One had a mask over her right eye, the other the left. One had light blonde hair, while the other's was pure black. One was more feminine while the other more masculine. They looked quite aloof as if they didn't care about their arrival. Loli first noticed Dondo Chaka's large frame. What are those loose dash, she started, but stopped herself the moment she saw Neliel who was back to her full power adult form. Neither Loli nor Minoli could stand up against Neliel even if they attacked her together. She looked a little nervous. Even if Neliel was one of the most aloof Erencart that still didn't mean they felt safe if they insulted her fraction. Even if the two of them were practically Aizen's aides and lost no chase Erencart didn't tend to respect political power only personal power. This meant they were quite used to having to gritting their teeth and putting up with others since their personal power was rather lacking amongst the members of Lost No Chase. When Hisashi's group got closer she gulped. Even if most of them weren't Erenkar, being faced with five Vasto Lord was still very unusual. The vast majority of Erenkar in Lost No Chase had been Ajuchas before transforming. The amount that succeeded in becoming Vasto Lord could be counted on one hand, at least before now. She was now meeting a group of five of them at once. Even if they weren't strong enough to handle the strongest of Lost No Chase, at least not before becoming Erencar, they were still formidable and had reached this level of strength all on their own unlike almost anyone else there. Hisashi stood at the front towering over the two petite girls. Loli looked him up and down. Besides the four bladed arms he looked surprisingly human. She wasn't sure why, but despite not giving off a dangerous amount of spirit pressure he felt dangerous. It was like the feeling of being stalked by a predator you couldn't see. Quite unsettling. More so than most hollow she met and even the others in her group. Aizen Sama has been expecting you, she said nervously. He could see some anger in her eyes though. Unsurprising with how much she hated having to be subservient to anyone but Aizen. She hated the feeling of being inferior to others or having to bow to others. The only one she should be below is Aizen at least meanly seemed mostly relaxed though still slightly weary with all the newcomers. Hisashi smiled. Thanks for the warm welcome, he said every so slightly sarcastic. Apache chuckled causing Loli to blush from a combination of embarrassment and irritation. It seems they hadn't missed what she was about to say first even if she caught herself halfway. F follow me, she managed to get out through gritted teeth. Minoli smiled at first, but when Loli sent her a glare that quickly disappeared. Hisashi followed them and the rest of his group followed suit behind him. They were lead through a bunch of hallways, chambers, open spaces for quite some time. It looked like getting lost here was exceptionally easy since except for a few open spaces so much looked alike since everything seemed to be made up out of the same white material and geometric shapes. Most hallways and rooms couldn't be told apart from one another. Eventually they were lead into a room with a long white table surrounded by chairs with tall backs. On each chair was an Erencar. A short, slender, somewhat androgynous male Erencar. His skin was as pale as bone and shaggy black hair down to his neck. His eyes were a vibrant green with cat-like slit pupils. He had on black mascara with two black lines descending from his lower eyelids to his jaw and black lipstick on his upper lip. He was wearing white hakama and a fitted white jacket with long coattails and a tall collar. His hollow mask covered the left side of his head, but left his face uncovered. Alquiora Cipher An Erencar that looked like a short stocky elderly man with short slick back gray hair and a thick mustache. His right eye was shut due to a thick scar running across it. His hollow mask framed his face like a white crown. He was wearing a white hakama, a white short-sleeved coat lined with black fur, a pair of black fur-lined golden bracers and golden ropes around his waist tied with a round golden buckle with a sun engraved on it. Berrigan Lizen Baron A tall male Erencar with parted shaggy shoulder-length brown hair and a faded goatee. All that was left of his hollow mask was a lower jaw lined with teeth hanging around his neck. He was wearing a white hakama, white coat with a lapel and popped collar. A black sash tied his zampakudo to his waist. 
His jacket was left open enough to reveal the hollow hole in the center of his chest. Coyote Stark A very tall and lanky male Aaron Carr with long sleek black hair down to his shoulders. A large white eye patch covered his left eye. He wore white hakama tucked inside his black boots with curled toes like a jester. A white coat with a tall popped collar that didn't cover his upper chest. He wore three silver bangles on each wrist. Noitra Gilga A tall muscular dark-skinned bald male Aaron Carr. The only thing left of his mask were a row of bony spike running along the crest of his head like a mohawk and a necklace of white teeth like pieces of bone around his neck. He wore white hakama and a long sleeve form fitting white jacket with black accents. Zamari Larue A tall thin male Aaron Carr with shoulder-length pink hair with bangs covering the right side of his face. His mask had turned into a pair of glasses. He wore a white form-fitting jacket with a turtleneck and white hakama, both of which had black accents. Salaporo Grands Another appeared to be male, but since his head was concealed with a tall cylindrical white mask that completely concealed his head with eight holes in it, the only indication was the body shape. He wore a long frilly white black lined coat with a tall upright wavy collar over what seemed to be a long white dress that came down to his ankles as if he were some kind of frivolous young master. Araniero Araruri. Then there was the only female Espada in the room. She had short wavy purple hair done up in two short twin tails with a fringe falling over the right side of her face. All that was left of her mask looked like a white spiky hair pin pinning back the left side of her hair keeping it out of her face. She had a purple teardrop on each of her cheeks below her eyes, her fingernails were painted black and she had painted her lips purple. She wore a small frilly short-sleeved white dress with large poofy shoulders that emphasized her breasts, fingerless evening-style gloves, black knee-high boots and leg warmers up to her thighs that attached to garters. Her look evoked a gothic Lolita impression despite its mostly white appearance. On her back were two white wing-shaped things, he wasn't sure if they were real wings or just part of her flamboyant outfit. Sirachi Sanderwichi A tall muscular male Aaron Carr with short spiky black hair and blue eyes. He had a prominent Van Dyke-style beard and mustache. All that was left of his mask looked like a forehead protector with two small horns on it. He wore a white form-fitting jacket with fringes along the forearm of the sleeves with a tall popped collar, white pants with tattered hems, and a red sash tied around his waist. Dordoni Alessandro del Sacaccio The last one was another male Aaron Carr with a large burnt orange afro, mutton chops, and a goatee. The only remains of his hollow mask was a skiing-style sunglasses-like shape on his forehead with a blue star in the middle. He wore a tight white pants and coat that had large frills along the collar and thighs. Ganton Bain Muscata Collapse at the head of the table Eisen was seated. He smiled at Loli and Memoli warmly which caused them to blush. Thank you for guiding them here for me, he said. Chapter 87 First Impressions Given that there were already ten other Arankar besides Eisen there those were probably the Espada. Since Grimgel wasn't among them it seemed he had not yet managed to become one of the Espada yet. Some of the Priveron Espada from the series were also still Espada. Most of them looked at them with some curiosity, but as Espada they weren't too bothered. They felt the newcomers might be impressive outside of Los Noches, but within Los Noches walls they felt there were plenty of others on their level. The one that stood out most was Neutra who was staring at Neliel with a look that could kill. After he finally felt he had gotten the upper hand over her and dumped her disgraced ass outside of Los Noches here she was once again as if all he did was for nothing. Neliel just returned his glare neutrally, as she always had. Aizen smiled, spreading his hands theatrically. Welcome to Lost No Chase, so what have you decided on, he said. Hisashi stepped forward ahead of the others, smiling back at Aizen. We would like to join, he responded for their group. Aizen nodded and clapped his hands once with satisfaction. Excellent. I'm so glad to hear that. Welcome to Lost No Chase, he said. Dordoni stood up with a wide smile. Welcome, he bellowed excitedly. Ganton Bane nodded in agreement, but most of the other Arankar paid them no heed. The only other exception was Surachi. 
Finally some more women, it was getting so boring with all these guys, she said completely ignoring Loli and Minoli. She looked over at Neliel. Also welcome back Neliel, she said. Neliel gave her a polite nod. Thank you Sarachi, she said. Hisashi expected she wouldn't be as excited about their arrival if she realized it meant soon she would likely lose her position as an espada. Neliel already was powerful enough to replace one of the espada. Once they became Erinkar Harabel definitely was powerful enough to replace another since she had been Espada Numera Trace in the original timeline. Not to mention Apache, Sung Sun, and Mila Rose each of which actually stood a good chance at becoming one now that they had become Vasto Lord before even joining. Lastly there was of course himself. The only ones in the group with no potential to become one would be Neliel's Fraction who had their masks completely removed to cripple them. Apache frowned at Surachi. Sun Sun smiled. So nice to meet you too, she said. Hisashi could tell it wasn't one of her genuine smiles though, unlike Apache Sun Sun tried to avoid making enemies when she could. Sure. Mila Rose said uncaringly. Tyr and Neliel didn't give any further reaction. Surachi seemed she wanted to talk more with them. Hisashi looked over all those there again. They were effectively in the snake pit now. It's nice to meet you all too, he said. Surachi snorted and looked away. It seemed he was less welcome than the girls were. He just ignored it though, like Loli he wasn't someone he was particularly looking forward to getting to know. Even if she was totally his type that was purely physically. Like Loli her personality was an entirely different matter. Are we still needed here? Alquiora asked emotionlessly. Aizen sighed but shook his head. No, he said. Alquiora simply nodded and left without even speaking with them. Araniero followed shortly after. Neutra was still glaring at Neliel who continued to ignore him. His knuckles white from being clenched so tightly. Salapora was giving them an intrigued look, but said nothing. Berrigan was looking at Haribel with some disgruntlement, however it was nothing like the way Neutra was towards Neliel. Hisashi knew this wasn't something to be concerned about since Berrigan and Haribel got along well enough and lost no chase despite their history in the original so he doubted it would be different this time around. He was more concerned about what Neutra might try. We still need to talk about turning you into Erinkar, but first let's get you settled in. Lowly. Meanly, please show our new members their quarters, he said. The two girls nodded obsequiously. Hisashi always found their behavior strange. Hollow might bow to the stronger party, but it was rare for them to do so so willingly. Usually there was resistance and desire to overthrow. This went for ones like Grimjow and Neutra. However he didn't sense that from the two of them. The alternative was ones like Alquiora that didn't seem rebellious even when they kneeled, but just didn't have the motivation to overthrow those above them. We've like shared quarters, Haribel said taking the lead. They had decided to at least for now have Haribel act like she was the leader publicly since that was the assumption Aizen had made given that she had been the leader of the Trace Bestias. This would allow them to hide Hisashi's position a little from the rest of Lost No Chase and get the others to underestimate him some. The other option would have been Neliel, but though she was powerful and caring she didn't make for a great leader. Lowly raised her eyebrow looking over their entire group. All of you? she asked. Haribel nodded slightly. Yes, we have been sharing the same cave for so long, we've grown accustomed to living together, she said. Even the guys? Loli asked. Haribel glanced over at Hisashi for a moment then simply nodded. Hisashi couldn't help but smirk a little hearing her request for them to live together. Haribel noticed and rolled her eyes, but didn't say anything. Okay follow us, Loli said. I look forward to our cooperation, Aizen said sporting his creepy fake smile. They all bowed before heading out after the two girls. Neutra hadn't stopped flaring until they left the room. Hisashi was convinced he would be looking for trouble soon enough. Thankfully he had healed Neliel who was powerful enough to defeat him all by herself, let alone the rest of them being around. Neutra wasn't above taking advantage of their weaker members, though so everyone would need to be on their guard. Chapter 88 Cats and Birds 
Neliel excitedly jumped beside Hisashi hugging onto one of his arms as they headed out. The other Espada that knew Neliel from when she was the Numera Trace Espada were surprised to see the usually calm and collected Neliel this way. Hisashi and the others followed lowly and Minoli's lead. They had walked down a few hallways when suddenly Surechi caught up with them. Wait up, she yelled after them. They all turned in surprise. Loli looked annoyed to have been interrupted, but didn't say anything and just kept walking. Surachi ignored the two leading them and Hisashi while skipping along with them. Good to see see you again, Neliel, she tried again. Neliel simply nodded before focusing back on Hisashi. She seemed more interested in hugging onto Hisashi than dealing with this superficial girl. Surachi sighed, but turned her attention to Haribel and the Trace Bestias instead giving them her best smile. Hi, I'm Surachi, she introduced herself to them. Haribel also nodded unsurely. Surachi sighed again. Another strong silent type, she said exasperatedly. She looked over at the Trace Bestias. What about the three of you? she asked. Apache snorted. Sun Sun chuckled from behind her sleeve. Don't mind her. She takes some time to warm up to everyone, she said lightheartedly. Mila Rose smirked. How strong are you? she asked. Surachi raised her eyebrow. Strong enough, she said. Hisashi looked at her curiously as she continued trying to strike up a conversation with the girls. He was wondering what had led her to reach out to them. After some thinking the only guess he came up with was that she hoped that with a bunch of female hollow joining up she might convince them to join her fraction. That would explain why she had no interest in himself and Neliel and her fraction. She was probably well aware now that Neliel was back to her peak strength she easily surpassed Surachi and would likely soon be rejoining the Espada. She was just wasting her time though since even if none of them became Espada they would still not be joining her and instead join under Neliel's fraction. However he was convinced all of them would be much more powerful than Surachi once they became Arankar. He was quite sure he was more powerful than Surachi even as he was, but he would rather not reveal any of his trump cards if he had the option. The truth was she really should be more worried about how much longer would Surachi get to remain as an Espada than being concerned about expanding her fraction. Soon Neliel would likely retake her former position. If not her, either Haribel or Hisashi himself would since they all needed to stick together. Grimjow would likely do so too once he gained full control of his newly gained powers. Then there was Yami who didn't seem to be on the Espada yet, but was probably somewhere in Lost No Chase right now. Her concern should be how long she could last as one of the Espada as she was one of the weakest amongst the current selection of Espada. The first to risk dropping out were her, Dordoni and Gantenbane. He wasn't entirely sure how those three stacked up against each other, but he knew all three of them were already Priveron Espada at least by the time the Arankar first showed up in Karakura. Hisashi chose not to interfere with her trying to ingratiate herself with the girls though even if it was for the purposes of winning them over to her own team. Sure her personality wasn't the best, but she hadn't been an eyes and loyalist the way Loli and Minoli were. There was still the possibility of winning her over to their side, but he wouldn't be holding his breath for it. They came across Grimjow leaning against a wall before they got to their new quarters. What are you doing here? Loli asked indignantly. Shut it shorty. Grimjow growled out dismissively before his eyes settled back on Hisashi. Loli gritted her teeth before stomping up towards him. You only just joined. Not only that, but you came back like a beaten dog not too long ago. Know your place, she sneered. How dare he dismiss her like that? She already had to put up with the disrespect of most of the Espada, she wasn't going to be putting up with it coming from members not even powerful enough to be an Espada. Grimjow's gaze hardened as it returned to her. He didn't like being disrespected and when it was someone he felt was below him he didn't accept it. Faster than Lowly could respond he dashed for her his hand shooting towards her eye with his fingers stretched like a blade. Before he could gouge out her eye though Hisashi interfered grabbing a hold of his hand that was now mere inches away from a terrified Loli's eyeball. He had already been faster than Grimjow during their last meeting and had pumped most of his stat points gained since then into his speed. Since he was already standing quite close to her interfering wasn't too hard. 
Lowly audibly gulped looking between Hisashi and Grimjow who were staring at each other and Grimjow's hand that was still shaking as he was trying to overpower Hisashi to finish his attack. How dare you? Aizen will hear about this, she exclaimed. Grimjow clicked his tongue, but did pull his claw from Hisashi's grip then walked off. This isn't over yet, he said looking back over his shoulder, but he was looking at Hisashi instead of Loli. It was clear their meeting hadn't been an accident and he hadn't given up on his prey yet. He had already escaped him twice and it was getting on Grimjow's nerves. Loli was glaring at his back until he turned the corner leaving her sight. She breathed in deeply a few times before calming down. She looked over the group, her eye eventually settling on Hisashi before looking away from him. T thanks, she murmured not used to expressing her gratitude. She had even been treating him badly. Worse yet this vast O Lord had been able to save her from Grimjow's attack that she hadn't even been able to react to which embarrassed her. Chapter 89 Settling In Sirachi sighed. Just ignore him. He isn't the only one like that here. If he gives you any trouble you can come to me, she said still trying to ingratiate the girls to her. Hisashi just shook his head. It had already been shown he could probably stand up against Grimjow and she should know Neliel definitely could stand up to Grimjow so why would Haribel or the Trace Bestias go to Sirachi for help in dealing with Grimjow? Neliel quickly found her spot on his arm again now that the fight was over as if nothing had happened in the first place. She wasn't worried as she could interfere if she needed to. Next time I will kick his ass myself, Apache said. Mila Rose smirked. If I don't get to him first, she chimed in. Sun Sun chuckled. Sure, I'll leave the troublesome stuff to you too, she said. Sirachi smiled. I wouldn't underestimate him too much. He might be one of our newer members, but he is quite powerful among those below us as Spada, she said. Apache snorted. Well, Jack didn't have any problems getting rid of him last time, she retorted. To avoid the remote chance that Aizen might have investigated the poor human that White killed and managed to remember its name, he had convinced the others to act like his name was Jack A. Boreas. Although it was a stretch for Aizen to remember an insignificant human that happened to stumble upon one of his operations around two decades ago, he wouldn't put it past him either so he would prefer not to risk it by using his human name with anyone he didn't trust entirely and lost no chase. Sirachi raised her brow realizing him stopping Grimjow before hadn't been a fluke despite him only being a vast o lord. It seemed her goal was getting tougher as she wasn't only competing with Neliel to get their respect, but it seemed this guy might be troublesome too. Loli and Minoli eventually led them to their new quarters. By the time they got there Loli had regained her composure and her haughtiness seeped back into her behavior. It seemed even saving her once could only do so much with her innate personality. Lowly opened the door to their quarters. You will be staying here for now until your positions in Lost No Chase are determined, she said. She didn't wait any further and just left without even saying goodbye. Minoli seemed unsure, but quickly ran after her to catch up. Apache ran into their new quarters, excited to explore. Neliel smiled pulling Hisashi by the arm into their new home. Let's go explore, she said excitedly. Hisashi chuckled lightly. All right, all right, he agreed. The others joined after them to explore their new home for the foreseeable future. Sirachi smiled. I'll let you all explore your new quarters. I look forward to seeing more of you, she said before also leaving them alone. Haribel simply nodded and closed the door after her. Wait for me, Sun Sun said slithering after them. There was a large main room along with some hallways that contained smaller rooms. Some things of note were the lack of a kitchen and the bathrooms didn't contain toilets. It made sense though since Hollow didn't eat regular food nor had a need to go to the bathroom. Everything was practically empty though so they would need to figure out what to do regarding decorating the place. It appeared to be a sweep the size of a small mansion. It was a little strange from human perspective since despite its size it wasn't a separate building. Instead, it was part of Lost Noche's greater structure. The unusually smooth white walls and tiled floors giving off a cold atmosphere rather than something one could consider a home. It was still preferable to the sandy desert that made up most of Hueco Mundo or even their cave hideout. 
At least the suite seemed to be on an exterior wall. Or was it an interior wall since it was all in the huge dome of Las Noches? Either way there were windows and they let in some of the still cold moonlight. Since each Espada had their own palace, they probably wouldn't be staying there all that long since at least one of them was likely going to become an Espada soon. They would need at least one of them to do so to facilitate them sticking together under an Espada rather than joining someone else. It turned out things in Las Noches didn't move that much faster than they did in the rest of Hueco Mundo as they wouldn't be getting transformed into Arancar right away. There were still tasks to be done and tests to participate in before they would be allowed to become Arancar. After everyone got settled down Hisashi was relaxing in his own room. They didn't need anything like sleep, but it was nice sometimes to simply relax and not think about anything. The bedroom door creaked open and Nelio's head poked from behind it. She quietly snuck onto the bed with him curling up against him like she had gotten used to during the time they spent together before getting to Lost No Chase. Since he had already gotten used to it he didn't say anything about it and let her do as she pleased. They spent the first few days getting settled while the girls furnished and decorated their quarters at least to the extent that was available in Hueco Mundo. Hisashi only really got a say over the decoration of his own room. It seems even if they were hollow instead of human that didn't mean they weren't women after all. One thing that was a little surprising was just how empty Lost No Chase seemed. Even if there were more Arancar than shown in the show Lost No Chase was absolutely huge so it actually wasn't that hard to spend a day without running into anyone else. On top of that most of the Arancar weren't very sociable. The only one that had come to visit them at all had been Suruchi who still seemed to be trying to win over the girls though she was wary of Nelio. Chapter 90, Down the Rabbit Hole Back on Earth, August 19th, Reina arrived in front of a small rundown store on a bare plot in a back alley of Karakura Town. It was a traditional-style two-story Japanese building built out of wood and plaster walls with a black tile roof. A big sign hung above the sliding wood door entrance that simply said Urahara Shop. Due to its diminutive size it looked more like a home than a shop if one ignored the sign. The building stood out from its surroundings not only due to its traditional style, but also because it was surrounded by much taller modern-looking flats causing quite the contrast. A white compact Japanese truck was parked beside the building. The mostly gravel plot with some grass growing here and there indicating a lack of maintenance didn't help the shabby appearance it was giving off. Reina looked the place up and down. Did I really come to the right place? She wondered to herself in confusion. She hesitated. I wasn't expecting something quite so. Run down when Masaki invited me over. Should I call to make sure? She wondered. Before she could decide one of the front doors slid open revealing a cute little black-haired girl. Her hair was put up in two ponytails coming down to her shoulders. Her bangs were parted down the middle, but a single long tuft of hair seemed to have escaped this hanging down the center of her face. She was wearing a white t-shirt that said Urahara Shop in red on it, a pink skirt with white circles on it, and a pair of sandals. The two stared at each other for a while in awkward silence, but the girl didn't seem to plan to say anything at all. Eventually Reina caved. Hi there, um. I was told to meet someone here. I think. She said awkwardly. The girl looked at her silently for a little longer. H hello, she eventually managed to get out in a shy whisper. This didn't help Reina all that much though as it didn't answer any of her questions. Reina bit her lip. Okay, well, is Masaki here? She asked trying to keep it simple for the little girl. The girl nodded again, but still did nothing else. Reina nodded slowly. Then could I meet her? She asked unsurely. Suddenly a boy with short spiky red hair wearing the same t-shirt and blue sweatpants popped up from behind the girl with an annoyed look on his face. He grinded both his knuckles on the sides of his head. You Ruri, you idiot. Stop wasting time, he growls at her. That hurts, Jean Takuin. You Ruru cried out in tears. Jean Ta continued grinding his knuckles on the sides of her head. Shut up. Maybe you will learn this time, he yelled back. He suddenly stopped when Reina jumped in and hit the top of his head. Ah, what the hell do you think you're doing? he cried out holding onto his head. Reina stared at him with a menacing smile and cracked her fist. 
I would like to know what you think you're doing. You brat, she asked menacingly. Yururu quickly hid behind her back holding onto her clothes nervously and trying to make herself as small as possible. Jinta glared at her with tears in the corners of his eyes for a while. Whatever, come in, he finally said begrudgingly guiding them into the store. Reina narrowed her eyes at him, but didn't say anything further about it. The store portion of the building took up only a small room lined with waist-height wooden shelves stocking a large variety of strange products. Sitting in the back on an elevated platform was a large muscular lightly tanned man with his black hair and cornrows and a large handlebar mustache. He wore glasses with thin rectangular lenses, a white t-shirt and blue apron. He nodded, but didn't say anything. Instead he got up removing one of the wooden panels he was sitting on to reveal a large dark hole with a ladder leading down into it. Jinta followed them while grumbling. Climbing down the ladder took quite a while until eventually the hole opened up into a giant square room large enough to hold a city block with blue walls and ceiling. The ground was a rocky terrain. Reina looked around in amazement while still climbing down the ladder. So this is Yurura's basement, she thought remembering the things Masaki had mentioned to her over the phone. It didn't take her long to find who she was looking for as she found a group in the distance. It was Masaki having another training session with Ichigo and Ishida while they were being leisurely watched by a plush lion, Urahara, and the black cat. Reina gulped watching the training as it was rather spartan. The orange head is her son, right? She wondered. Questioning if that actually was the case with how ruthless Masaki was. The first to notice their arrival was Urahara who was watching her intently, his eyes were covered in the shadow of his bucket hat. It was quickly replaced with a big smile, but you could still see a hidden glint in his eyes if you looked close enough. Oh my, and who do we have here? he asked excitedly. As soon as Urahara called attention to them everyone stopped what they were doing and watched in curiosity except for Masaki who ran towards Reina with a wide smile. Reina-chan, she shouted. She pulled Reina into a big hug who returned it in kind. Masaki pulled back to take a look at Reina. I'm so glad you were able to make it here, she said. Reina smiled awkwardly looking at everyone that was staring at the two of them. Why yes, you too, she said. Urahara chuckled. Are you going to introduce the rest of us to this young lady? he asked. Rain swore the black cat seemed to roll its eyes at him. I must be imagining things, she thought. Chapter 91 Reina Meets the Cast Masaki coughed awkwardly. All right. Well, it looks like you already met Jin Takuin, Yurura Chan, and Tasai San, she said, pointing at the three that had leave Reina there. Reina nodded. Well, they didn't introduce themselves, but I figured out Jin Takuin and Yurura Chan's names already. I hadn't been introduced to Tasai San yet, though, she explained. The large muscular man, Tesai, hummed in agreement while nodding. Masaki smiled. Now more important. This handsome boy is my son, she said dragging Ichigo over to Reina. Ichigo deadpanned. Oh now you have positive things to say about me, he grumbled. Masaki simply ignored his grumbling though. Ichigo, this is Reina. She has been one of the ones taking care of me. It might have been a rough start, but we're practically best friends now, she said with a wide smile. Reina smiled, touched by Masaki's words. Masaki wasn't the only one that felt that way since she had long become Reina's best friend too after all. Living together for so many years the only results really can be either despising each other or growing genuine love and care for them. She smiled at Ichigo. Hi, I'm Reina. We might not have met before, but your mother can't stop talking about you so it doesn't feel like a first meeting, she said with a chuckle. Masaki blushed a little. I don't talk about him all the time, she said in embarrassment, trying to defend herself. Ichigo seemed to be the most embarrassed out of all of them, not used to being talked about in such a way. It didn't help that Reina was a very attractive young woman. He wouldn't admit whether she looked better than Oraheim. As if some type of sixth sense was activated Oraheim quickly came up interrupting them and bowed politely. Hi, I'm in a way Oraheim. Ichigo's best friend, she said. Reina chuckled watching the young girl. 
Even if Ichigo was too dense to see what was going on, she definitely wasn't. Not that it mattered, though, since she wasn't interested in the boy. Not only was he too young, but he was even her best friend's son. That would be a recipe for disaster. It's a delight to meet you, she said. Oreheim blushed. It was like punching a pillow. There was no resistance, making her feel awkward at her worries. And nice to meet you, too, she said meekly. Masaki looked at Oreheim with a raised brow. Friends, she asked. Oreheim blushed and looked away. She wasn't used to being treated like that and for the longest time she had made no progress in her relationship with the Dan Sichigo. That was changing ever since his mother came back into the picture though as she kept pushing for her to become her daughter-in-law. Masaki snorted at the girl trying to act ignorant but decided to let her off for now instead moving on to a straight-laced boy with chin-length black hair parted down the center. He was wearing a school outfit comprised of tan slacks and a white shirt with a blue and mustard diagonal striped tie. He wore a slim pair of glasses. This is another of Ichigo's friends, Ishida Yuryu, Masaki said. Ishida pushed up his glasses and nodded politely. Nice to meet you, he said flatly. Reina nodded back hesitantly. H. Hi, she said awkwardly not knowing how to return his natural deadpan energy. Don't mind him, that's just how his personality is, Masaki said without care for Ishida's feelings. Urahara smirked. Leaving the best for last, he asked playfully. Masaki rolled her eyes. And this is Urahara Kasuk. Don't be fooled though. This old man is much older than he looks, she said with a smirk as she called him out. Kasuk grabbed at his heart dramatically. How could you? he asked. The smirk tugging at his lips was enough to give him away. He picked up the black cat. Anyway. This is your Ruchi, he continued. Before Reina could react the cat spoke in a deep voice. Hello. As he said, I'm your Ruchi. Reina looked at the cat in surprise. Despite knowing about Hollow seeing a talking cat was something entirely new. At least now she was sure the cat had rolled its eyes at Urahara before. It was definitely smart enough for that. Urahara looked at Reina with interest. I hear you have an interesting power, he said. Leave the poor girl alone, Masaki warned him. He raised his hands in surrender, but Reina wasn't sure he had actually given up from his smile. Yuruchi jumped down from Urahara's grasp and walked around Reina as if inspecting her. Reina had a conflicted expression as she kind of wanted to pet the cat, but wasn't sure if talking cats appreciated that kind of thing. The cat hummed as if considering something before walking away. Reina still looked a little confused, but shrugged it off. The only one missing right now is Chad, Ichigo's only other friend. He doesn't have very many due to his personality, Masaki said. Ichigo looked offended. I have friends, he argued. Masaki smiled. I have yet to meet any, she said continuing to tease her son. All Ichigo could do was grit his teeth and bear it. Rain shook her head. So, anyway, what did I interrupt? She asked out of curiosity. Masaki's smile grew even wider. Nothing much. Just some more training. Ishida Kuin here did something reckless and lost his Quincy powers so we are working on fixing that. Meanwhile I have been training Ichigo at the same time since things should never have gotten to that point in the first place. If only his mother had been around to correct him, she sighed with a hand on her cheek. Ichigo snorted while looking away from her. I was doing just fine. He started saying. Masaki glared at him quickly shutting him up causing a mirthful chuckle to escape Reina's lips only embarrassing Ichigo even further. Reina rolled her eyes at the two, but understood the two had a lot of time to make up for so it was good to see their relationship was still good. Chapter 92 Questions and Suspicions Masaki went back to training Ichigo and Ishida to their great displeasure. It wasn't like they were given a choice though. Reina ended up sitting on some old school beach chairs, the unfoldable kind with the wooden frame and cloth span between it to lay down on. 
Urahara had even put out a parasol for the sun that wasn't even present and provided them with fancy tropical drinks like they were at some kind of beach resort instead of watching Masaki beat, I had trained the two boys. Yururu and Jinta seemed to be going through their own training program by sparring each other. Reina had joined Urahara and Oraheim in watching the show. It didn't take long for Yuruchi to show up and take sit on top of Urahara's head. After some small talk things suddenly turned a little more serious. Urahara smiled kindly. So tell us more about yourself, he said nonchalantly. Yuruchi also looked over curiously. Orheim seemed to be most excited of everyone grabbing a hold of Reina's hands. Yeah, I want to know too, she said excitedly. Hmm, I don't know. Most of it really wasn't that interesting, I lived in Naruki City my whole life. The one that has always stood out was Big Brother, she said humbly. If Masaki hadn't been distracted she would have vehemently disagreed. Yurahara and Yuruchi seemed to perk up at the mention of her brother. Oh that's not very far is it? Oraheim asked curiously. Reina smiled gently. No, it's just one town over. You can get there in less than an hour, she explained. Orheim nodded. She still hadn't let go of Reina's hands. So what do you do? Are you in college? she asked. Reina blushed lightly. Thanks, but I've already completed college. I am the CEO of a computer company, she said trying to simplify it as best as she could for Oraheim who though not outright stupid, didn't seem to be the brightest either. Oraheim looked at her in surprise. No way? But you look so young, she said. Reina simply smiled. You mentioned you had a brother too. What does he do? Oraheim asked curiously. Reina smiled awkwardly. Right. Um, he died around twenty years ago, she explained. Oraheim looked at her sadly and bowed towards her. Oh no! I'm so sorry, she said apologetically. No you don't have to be. He came back, she said. He came back? Oraheim asked in confusion. Well he became a hollow, Reina explained. Oraheim gasped looking at her closely. That happened to my brother too. Are you okay? she asked with concern. She might have been wary about Reina at first since she was worried Ichigo might be interested, but she felt bad for this young woman that experienced something so similar to herself. Reina smiled. Yeah. He was actually gone for over ten years, but then actually saved me, she said. Urahara raised his brow. Are you sure it was actually your brother? He interjected. She shook her head. Yes, he knew things only brother would have known, she said. Urahara closed his eyes and seemed to be considering things. Are you sure? Some hollow can be quite tricky preferring to manipulate their prey, Yurichi said. Reina glared at the cat. Yes. He has been protecting and helping me for over a decade, she said shortly, rather offended by the implication she was making. She breathed in deeply to calm herself down a little. He also saved Masaki twice and helped her get used to her new power. He didn't have to do any of that and could have just left her to die, she said to further her argument. Sorry, Yuruchi said awkwardly. While they were distracted with their argument Masaki had walked up. Now, now, you two don't bother her. I already told you Asashi saved me and took care of me, she said. Urahara looked away awkwardly. Right, he said. I'm sorry, Reina. These two tend to get a little paranoid, Masaki explained. Reina gave her a weak smile. It's okay. I understand it might be hard to believe. Even more so if someone hasn't met him yet, she said. She looked at Urahara. My brother is the one that programmed the core of the operating system my company sells when he wasn't even 16 yet. If it hadn't been for him returning and helping me understand it neither I nor anyone else would have been able to tease apart what he had done to create something so far ahead of the competition even 10 years after he originally created it. Are you telling me it's possible for just some hollow to do that? She asked with a little sarcasm sneaking into her question. I guess that would be hard. Urahara hesitantly admitted. Not only that, 
but he also knew more about this Aizen's plan than any of you know and was sharing that, she continued. Well it has yet to be determined whether all of that is true, Urahara tried to argue. Reina glared at him. What has he done to wrong any of you? she asked. Urahara scratched the back of his head and chuckled. Uh, nothing, but he admitted. No buts, Reina said. Masaki got between Reina and Urahara. She glared at the latter. All right, no more of this. I invited her here to make friends. Not for some kind of interrogation, she said with finality. After everything you've been through you should understand our concerns, Yoruchi cut in. Even if you don't believe him or Reina, are you saying you are also questioning my judgment after spending years with him? Masaki asked. Fine, Yoruchi said. That seemed to be the end of that argument. Well, now that we got that over and done with, how about you stay here for dinner? Masaki offered trying to lighten the mood. Reina nodded and smiled. That would be nice, she said. All right, let's celebrate with hot pot. Yururu, go ahead and get it started, Yurahara said excitedly. Yururu nodded heading upstairs. Jinta followed after her. Chapter 93, Settling I In Back in Hueco Mundo. Quite a few weeks had passed already since they joined Los Noches. Although more had happened than in most of his time in Hueco Mundo that consisted of almost endlessly hunting other hollow to grow his power with the only distractions being the girls, but surprisingly the headquarters of genius supervillain Aizen filled with the most powerful beings in Hueco Mundo wasn't actually that much more eventful than he had grown used to. It seemed the Arankar weren't much better than the Shinigami. They were all centuries old just like many Shinigami and they lived at a slower pace, compared to regular humans, just like the Shinigami did. Their long lives lead them to view months the way the humans might view days. Just like how when you are young waiting for your next birthday feels like an eternity, but by the time you are getting old a year flies by in what seems to be the blink of an eye before you even notice it. Hisashi could feel his own perception slowly changing as he lived longer, but across all three of his lives he had still only experienced fifty-nine years of life which still left him with quite a human perception of time. Getting older and being around other hollow was causing it to skew more than it had during his time on earth and even as a hollow though. All of this meant life in Los Noches though more eventful than simply hunting in Hueco Mundo was still quite slow-paced. He hadn't seen most of the high-ranking Arankar all that much yet. Sirachi had still been visiting them quite regularly trying to win over Haribel and the Trace Bestias without success though she seemed to be losing some steam as she realized she wasn't making any progress at it despite her continued efforts. Apache made it quite strained at times because she didn't give her the respect she really was expecting. Sirachi had grown less scared of Neliel as she spent more time with them and saw a completely different side of her as she acted almost like a spoiled teenage girl around Hisashi rather than the stoic Espada she had been used to before Neliel's original exile by Neutra. She still kept her distance knowing Neliel could kill her with just a little effort. She was convinced it wouldn't take long for Neliel to take back her spot in the Espada and she would do anything for the spot Neliel would take to not be her own. Surprisingly the ones he had been expecting most to cause trouble, Grimjow Jagerjax and Neutra Gilga, had been surprisingly quiet. He knew that could only last so long though as both weren't the type to just give up. Chances are Grimjow was trying to ensure he had either grown stronger or improved his abilities as an Arankar before giving it another try. As for Neutra though, he knew that Neutra despite how he acted aggressively like Grimjow did, deep down he was a coward. When he found out he couldn't beat Neliel in a fair fight he didn't train, instead he schemed to take advantage of her weaknesses and stabbed her in the back when the chance presented itself. The only other Arankar they had had some contact with were Loli and Minoli as they tended to be Aizen's little messengers and Aran girls that were used when he needed some stuff done that didn't require the most powerful Arankar to take action. It made sense since outside of their lack of power they were some of his most fervent followers and lost no chase. Probably the only person that had been as dedicated to him was the Shinigami girl, Hinamori Momo, who was his subordinate when he was still a captain in Soul Society. The other Espada hadn't really reached out in any way, but this hadn't been unexpected by him. Most of the others were rather neutral towards them and to put it in a human perspective, it has been just a couple of days since they last met when they joined Lost No Chase. 
Unlike the other girls Nellyl had effectively moved into his bedroom permanently, not even choosing her own bedroom. They had decorated their temporary home, but only to a limited degree since they had already discussed things and knew they wouldn't be staying there too long if things went as planned. Nellyl hadn't taken her spot amongst the Espada yet. Though Las Noches was quite lawless compared to Soul Society or Earth there were still a few rules and one of them was that you needed to be the current Espada to become one. Even if she had been one prior now that she had lost her position she would actually need to be the current Espada to take their numero. Originally he thought about having Nellyl defeat Noitra for his spot, but he was surprised to find she didn't actually have much of a drive to exact revenge on Noitra and was far more interested in him and their newfound family instead. He wasn't as good of a person and knowing what Noitra had done to his sweet Nellyl filled him with a desire to make Noitra suffer. Due to this he had changed his mind which would likely allow Noitra to stay amongst the Espada a little longer as long as he didn't step out of line so he could take appropriate revenge on Nellyl's behalf. Instead, he would probably have Nellio battle one of the lower-ranked Espada for their numero so she could reform her fraction with them under her at least for the time being. Dondo Chaka and Pesh were somewhat the odd members out as despite them originally being the closest members of her little family they had already been overtaken by Hisashi and Haribel. Meanwhile the Trace Bestias weren't far behind making them nervous as they already couldn't keep up power-wise due to Noitra forcefully destroying their masks. That's the end of this tale for now. Having caught up to the story it'll take longer to update from this point further but I promise not to drop the series. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 6. Peace.